We were discussing last time this equation. Let's at least get comfortable. Okay. So we were discussing this, uh, the, the, this equation and we said that that had solutions which you could then expand in powers of epsilon and this led to a solution pi zero is f zero, pi one is f zero log lambda plus f one pi 2 is f0 log squared lambda plus 2 f1 log lambda plus f2 and I'm sorry I'm writing this out again but I want to make a point about it pi 3 is f0 log cubed lambda plus 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 f3 and so you get a series of solutions like that, and in particular F0, F1, F2, and F3 are series in all this. Okay. Now, we also said that we take the number of points, so nu lambda was the number of x's in Fp to the fifth, such that P of x is zero, and um, notice that nu lambda is not the quantity that's usually calculated. Right? We're not making any attempt to, um, to eliminate the scale. So x's that differ by a scale are uh, counted separately. And we make no attempt to eliminate x equals naught. Of course, the usual object is uh, simply related. Nu lambda, n lambda, is nu lambda minus the origin over the number of scalings. So in this simple case, the two objects are, are, are very simply related. But we will, somehow it's easier to set out and try and calculate nu lambda. And then we said that uh, nu, we could reasonably expect to expand in base p, so we write that as nu naught plus nu 1p plus, plus nu 4p to the 4. And that's enough because if you know because the number is definitely less than p to the fifth, so if you know these coefficients, nu naught to nu four, you, uh, you you have finished. And then there was a homework. Nu lambda on the left has nothing to do with nu lambda on the right. Oh, a different use of lambda, right? Nu of lambda, okay, is that, okay? So well, each of these coefficients is a function of lambda. Good, thank you. Okay, and then there was a uh, homework problem to show that nu naught was, you take the series for f naught, you take the first p or the integer part of p over five terms, and you evaluate on lambda, and that gave you the answer. Okay. So, that was a surprise. So, uh, of course... Uh, there was a question, why are we doing this? And, and I gave a sort of silly answer yesterday, which Dave picked up on me. Uh, Dave picked up, which says that, that the answer is interesting for arithmetic. The, the point of, uh, of, 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 of this is that uh, these periods are extremely important in string theory. Whenever you calculate anything in string theory, um, string theory starts off life as a theory in 10 dimensions, say and you have to come down from 10 dimensions to 4, and the other 6 dimensions you take to be a calabi yau manifold, and the quantities that you see in the 4-dimensional world always come from quantities that you calculate on the calabi yau manifold, and the results, whenever you calculate something in the 4-dimensional world, you always calculate in terms of the periods. The periods are very, very physical objects in which... Uh, so the results, whether certain particles scatter into other particles... Um, and, and so on, and the strength in which they interact, and so on, all good determined by these periods. So the periods are very physical objects, and I always grew up thinking that we, the physicists, own them. Okay. And so it was 
it was uh, sort of paraphrased my first conversation with Fernando. It was uh, sort of, it went a bit like this. I said, uh, you know, we physicists know why these quantities are interesting. Why are you a humble mathematician interested? <laughs> so, so the answer was that they contain interesting, uh, interesting arithmetic. So th that's the interest. The interest is why are these quantities, which are sort of very interesting, why do they know about the arithmetic? And to that, I don't have a simple, um, I don't have a good answer. Okay. Now, um, I did something on the previous sheet that might have caused you to wonder which is that I've sort of written down a basis of solutions of the differential equation as if that's given by God. Okay. And that, of course, can never be true. So the, uh, this is a particular, we chose a particular pi of lambda and epsilon. You saw me do that by making a particular choice of the coefficients. Uh, the, the coefficients and their dependence on epsilon, and that, of course, leads you to a basis for the differential equation. But we could have chosen things differently, um, and then we would have been led to a different basis, and it's good to sort of mention that because, of course, it will come up later, which is that we chose certain coefficients, a, n of epsilon, in a reasonable way, such that um, a n of a n of zero was a n, which was this five n factorial over n factorial to the fifth. But we could have chosen a different set of coefficients: a n twiddle equals h of epsilon a n of epsilon, where h, h is any function of epsilon such that h of 0 is 1. Um, in particular, we could take h, epsilon would be 1 plus h1 epsilon plus 1 over 2 factorial, h2 epsilon squared, plus and so on. And this would change our basis. And so, I don't know if Dave will touch on this in his talk, but it leads to a certain monodromy, pi naught, pi one, pi two, pi three, changes, and so the pi zero is unchanged, the, the pi one changes by a multiple of pi zero, but by the addition of a multiple of pi zero, the pi two changes by, uh, again, the addition of pi zero and a certain multiple of pi one. And then I think it goes on h3, <coughs> 3 h2, 3 h1, and so on. So we can change the basis. We had this, so the basis were, was organized by the number of logarithms. So that it's, it's very reasonable to choose the first solution to have no logarithms. The second solution has one logarithm, but of course I could add a multiple of pi naught to pi one, and that leave that property alone. So in, in fact, F1 is, if you like, undefined, not undefined, we've defined it in, um, perfectly uniquely, but um, we could redefine it by adding a multiple of f0. Similarly, we could take f2 and add a multiple of f1 and plus a multiple of f0, and, and, and so on. Okay. Then, there was the homework problem, which said, okay, take mu of lambda, and work it out mod p, and to do that you take the sum over x, you take 1 minus p of x, raise it to the power p minus 1, and um, that's true with an error of order p, 
And so, in, in fact, in this way, you evaluate the expression we get. Okay. How would we go on? Well, you can go on in two ways. The one is, is just extending this. I don't recommend it. It's, it's what we, Zenia and I, did. Um, and that is to say that what you want to do to next order is to say that new lambda is some x in fp to the fifth. And then here you want to say 1 minus p of x to the power p, p minus 1, plus order p squared. Okay, and to see that that's the right thing to do, so again, it's the same argument. Uh, we saw that this was correct by considering the cases that p of x vanished or it didn't. Well, if p of x vanishes, then you count 1, and that must be correct. So what happens if p of x doesn't vanish? If p of x doesn't vanish, then p to the p minus 1, if it doesn't vanish, is 1 plus order p. <coughs> right? So this is physicist's notation. We're imagining everything expanded p-adically. Right? Now it's clear that if p to the p minus 1 is 1 plus a term of order p, then p to the p p minus 1, just by raising this to the p -th power, means you raise this to the p -th power, which is 1 plus order p squared. Okay. So your error, um, your error is of order p squared, and so that will, that will give you the next order term. So in principle, you can proceed like this, and uh, what you would do is you would consider x in fp to the fifth, 1 minus p to the x, and you take here higher and higher powers like this. Now, I don't advise doing it unless you're feeling, unless you're feeling uh, strong. Okay, whereas this power solving time for this one, I think, is, is, is half an hour, an hour or so. Um, this one took two people a semester of very hard work. Um, the expressions get very long. You have to, it's perturbation theory, you have to keep track of all the various sums from which you could get uh, terms of various orders. You get long expressions, and it's only when you start, when you put the, uh, start putting the terms together that you find very significant cancellations. And of course, if you make any mistakes, then the terms don't cancel. Um, and you find that nu of lambda is, you take this term f0, you now take it to the integer part of 2p over 5 terms. The argument is no longer lambda, but it's lambda to the p. And then there's a correction of order p plus p, you take this, to the, the F1, you have to differentiate it, again 2p over 5 terms, and evaluate it on lambda to the p plus order p squared. Like that. And this term here, just to be perfectly clear, what this means is the primed is not even the usual primed. We had this derivative operator, theta is d lambda db lambda, and what this means is f1 primed at lambda to the p means theta, so it's not even the usual derivative, theta f1, so you differentiate it, and then you evaluate it on lambda to the p. Yeah, okay. In the second one, you can do that, but that would be unwise because then you'd be forgetting the pattern, and then you'd need that pattern at next order. Right, so at next order, it's going to be lambda to the p squared, and so on. Okay. Why is it lambda to the p? Why is it lambda to the p? And that's simply because you need to know what you're talking about. Okay. So if you're working mod p, then if you're working mod p, lambda and lambda plus p are the same thing. And that's okay because f, if you've got some function, f of lambda plus p is f of lambda with an error of order p. Okay. But if you're working mod p squared, then this isn't good enough. On the other hand, if you work with lambda to the p, then you have the advantage that lambda plus p to the p is lambda to the p plus order p squared. Okay. So it's a more accurate way 
of, 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 writing, of writing Lambda. And, of course, ultimately, if you want to work toward a P-cubed, you would want to consider, instead of Lambda to the P, Lambda, you would want to write everything in terms of Lambda P squared, which, of course, is the same thing as Lambda mod P, but it's more accurate in this way. And ultimately, you will want to write everything in terms of type of lambda, which is the limit n tends to infinity, lambda p to the n, like that. Okay. Now, the second order result is sort of hard, so I don't advise doing it. So uh, a better way of doing it is that you guess the next order result. So, what's the next order result going to be? So, uh, to order p cubed, something with, with, with an error of order p cubed. So, what you do is just guess it. It'll be new lambda. It will be, well, it's bound to involve this f naught of lambda p squared. Um, and the coefficient is going to be 1 and there may be, you put in some ignorance, there may be a p squared term in there. It, it has to be a order p squared because of what you know about the lower order terms. Um, and then there's going to be a correction of order p, and that's bound to be f1 primed evaluated lambda p squared. And then there be, could be a correction to the coefficient here, 1 plus bp like that, and this, this would be taken to this would be taken to 3p over 5 terms, and this one also to 3p over 5 terms. And then we could allow for a p squared times a c times an f2 double prime of lambda p squared plus order p cubed. Okay. And so you write down the general, general term, in the general form, in terms of three unknown coefficients, a, b, and c, which are supposed to be independent of p. And then the, the simplest thing to do is just to compute, so take for low values of p, just compute uh, nu by counting with a computer, and it's very dramatic when it works, because, for example, um, if you can still compute, I think, for p equals 113, so, uh, lambda runs over 113 values. You've got 113 numbers to get right, and you have three <coughs> constants. So, it's very dramatic when it works. Um, and you find A, B, and C in this way. And then once you've found A, B, and C, then you go do it again to next order, and you compute some more, and so on. And very rapidly, you find the, uh, the answer. So, very rapidly then, if you don't make any mistakes... Um, the whole thing, of course, is, is, sens is, is sensitive to the slightest uh, arithmetic mistake. Okay. So then you find that nu is finally f naught taken to p terms, lambda p to the fourth, plus, and then this term turns out to be p over 1 minus p, f1 primed, also lambda p to the fourth, also taken to p terms, plus 1 over 2 factorial p over 1 minus p squared f2 double prime lambda p to the fourth. I'll, I'll stop writing the truncations here. Okay. Plus, uh, plus 1 over 4 factorial p over 1 minus p to the fourth f4, 1, 2, 3, 4, also lambda p to the fourth. Now, I would like to say that that was the answer, but that would be a lie. So there's an extra piece, which it, it is. Morally speaking, this is the answer. Um, but if I'm telling the truth, I want to actually tell you what it really is. So it's H3. Here there's a term P over 1 minus P cubed. I may be missing the 1 over 3 factorial. And then we have here, again, all this is truncation to p terms, f naught 1, 2, 3, plus p 
over 1 minus P F1 truncation of P terms 1, 2, 3 four derivatives plus order P to the fifth. Okay. Now, the ugly terms are not, in fact, ugly. They just correspond to a change of basis. So, this you see that this term F0 with three derivatives, it, all, all this it just corresponds to a, um, a change of basis corresponding to a function H of epsilon, which is 1 plus H3 epsilon cubed plus order epsilon to the fifth. We don't care about the terms of order epsilon fifth. So if you allow me to make a change of basis in the, in the uh, solutions of the differential equation with this h, then, in fact, in the new basis, you can forget about those terms. In the new basis, that's correct. So you get sort of a very pretty result like that. And then the other thing that you should say is, where, and this is interesting, it says, where does the f to the 4, where does the f4 come from? Okay, because in our... Um, we had a basis of four solutions to the differential equation. Ah, oh, okay, so I told you two lies. Someone say to me, what happens when five divides p minus one? So the, 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 right, so the two, cab two provisors, I've written down the sort of the simplest form of the answer. The, um, I'm assuming here that five doesn't divide p minus one. I'll comment on that case in just a minute. Um, right, so there was a change of basis, and there was an F4, okay? So where does the F4 come from? So pi of lambda epsilon is um, we said that this solved the equation epsilon to the fourth lambda to the epsilon, and then if you differentiate with respect to epsilon, if you differentiate pi with respect to epsilon, then you generate the four solutions to the differential equation. Now, if you um, don't stop, so you just write pi is sum 1 over n factorial, epsilon to the n, pi n, and you expand in powers of epsilon, then you generate an infinite series of functions, and hence, an and you expand them all, and you get an, an infinite series of f's, and it's the first of these new functions that you actually need to finish off here. Okay. Now, you don't, strictly speaking, need it. You can get away without... Well, the, the, the reason you don't really need it is that if we had calculated, if we think of, of calculating n rather than nu, then n is of order p cubed, right? There are roughly p cubed points in the manifold. And in fact, it's enough to know f0, f1, F2 and F3 to calculate N, because you know that um, N is less than P to the fourth. Okay. If, however, you want to write the result in sort of a nice way like this, then you need the F4. And we were sort of pleased with this result, and we took it to Roger Heath Brown in Oxford, and we said, isn't this a pretty result? And he said, no. And he said, your result is very ugly, he said. This very, uh, speaks directly. And um, the reason it's ugly is that you've got this order p to the fifth term here. And what you're saying is that the left-hand side, the new, is some integer. It's a real integer, right? A rational integer. The right-hand side is some Pleiadic integer, right? Something with an infinite number of digits. And what you're saying is that the first four terms, so you've got an infinite number of piadic digits, and you're saying that the first four digits are what you want, and the rest are rubbish. Okay. So much better to carry on calculating 
Okay, if you try and get a result that's true plus order p to the six plus order p to the seven, and so on, and try and get a pleiadic number which is a rational integer. And then, of course, you can see how to do that if you just add here plus dot dot dot, and you keep on, then in fact you get the exact answer. You get a pleiadic number whose first four digits are the number you want, and all the subsequent digits are zero. Okay. But if you want to write it nicely in that way, then you need the dot, 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 you need all these FNs, and you need all these terms that you get from expanding in this way. Well, I need to put dot, I, I'm abusing this, this equation, right? Uh, if you change basis, if you change basis with this function, I'll tell you more exactly what H is in a moment. If you, if you change basis with H, then this term vanishes, and then this first bit is the whole answer, and then the dot, dot, dots are what you want. So, so now the basis, what is H3 explicitly? What is H3 explicitly? Well, I could tell you what H3 is explicitly, but that's not so useful as if I tell you what H is. Okay. So H, in fact, so we have these coefficients, A, M, which are 5, M, factorial over m factorial to the fifth. And if you consider a r p over a r, so those, then this is, you can write that out in terms of factorials, or more interesting, if you write this out in the piad terms of the piadic gamma function, you can show that that's gamma 5 r p plus 1 over gamma p rp plus 1 to the fifth, and this, you see, is a function of rp. Okay, so that defines h. Okay, so um, uh, we saw that simply by staring at it for a good long time um, and, 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 and trying to think of an h that would work, and this one, this one works. Okay, so... That's the, that, that's the function that you want uh, as a change of basis. I mean, this formula looks a bit strange when you first look at it because this looks like a function of R and P separately, but of course, we've just, P plays a special role, so by the time you've written it this way, of course, this, this H really has a, has a sort of P index in it. Okay. Um, so now, in, in, in uh, paper one, the details are all there, they're a, bit, they're a bit tedious, but what, you can rewrite the answer this way. New lambda is sum m is naught to p minus 1. You can sum up the terms, and here we have, for example, a, m, and here you have 1 plus p plus p squared, so on, plus, plus p to the fourth, divided by a, m. 1 plus p plus p squared plus p cubed lambda to the m p to the fourth plus order p to the fifth. Okay. So, for example, you get uh, a series like that, or if you want to write it exactly, it's the sum m is naught to p minus 1 beta m tie lambda to the power m, where beta m is the limit n tends to infinity, a m 1 plus p 1 plus p plus p to the n plus 1 is the last term over a m 1 plus p plus p to the n. So this is just to this is just to say that the result is terribly periodic, right? That 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 that, that <coughs> clearly the periods are at the heart of all this. That that it's uh, the coefficients. You can write everything in terms of, of, of type in this in this obvious way. But the coefficients that appear here are, of course, intimately related to the coefficients that appear 
in the period. In fact, what you're doing is, you can see, you're taking higher and higher derivatives of the coefficients with respect to the index. <laughs> These beta elements, now you can write them in terms of Gauss sums. And I can do that next. And that indeed is how you would prove, because this has been sort of a feeling your way approach, nothing that is, 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 is really proved. But um, by writing in terms of Gauss sums, then you can actually prove the expressions. However, once I start writing things in terms of Gauss sums, then of course that will obscure the relation to the periods that I've wanted to stress. <coughs> Okay, before we go on and actually write things out in terms of uh, Gauss sums, that gets a bit long, um, there's fun to be had in various lower dimensions. So, um, the important, we've used the fact several times that this is a Calabi-Yau manifold. And, so a bit of personal notation, it's a quintic in CP4, and what makes it Calabi-Yau is that Five is four plus one, right? The degree is one bigger than the dimension of the projected space. And there are many Calabi Owls, but of course this, this one fits into a sort of sequence that the next one down is a K3, a quartic in P3. Um, there's the elliptic curve, P2 with a cubic. Then there's sort of a dimension Right, so the dimension zero, so the obvious thing you want to write down here is P1 with a quadric, which is two points. Okay, and the last one, so you'll spare me, I've got sort of captive audience, I can have some fun. Um, sort of uh, a dimension minus one manifold, which is P0 with a linear equation. And so we can have some fun with this. Let, let, let's look at, at, at P1 with a quadric. Okay, so this is uh, two points, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 2 psi x1, x2 is 0. And this is, well, for whatever, whatever it is, this becomes singular, right? This, the, the two cases, um, in, all these, in all these manifolds, there's a case when the manifold becomes singular uh, for a special value of psi, and this happens in this case when psi squared is 1, right? So when psi squared is 1, this factorizes into a product of, of two linear factors. But you can ask how many solutions are there to that equation? Now, of course, I know everyone knows the answer to that because it's a sort of standard thing that, 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 that you answer in terms of the Legendre symbol. However, all our formalism goes through. There's a lambda here, which will now be 1 over 2 psi squared. You can work out the differential equation, which I leave as an exercise. So you'll find that the the L is a linear equation. Theta <coughs> minus 2 lambda, 2 theta plus 1. Um, this has the happy property that you can integrate the equation in closed form, 1 over root 1 minus 4 lambda, which indeed is the sum that you expect, n equals 0 to infinity, 2n factorial over n factorial squared, lambda to the n. Okay. There's a pi 1, which is an f naught plus, sorry, we, the, there's a, a pi 1, which is an f naught log lambda plus f1. And F1 here is very easy. It's 2 sum 1 to infinity, 2n factorial over n factorial squared, sigma 2n minus sigma n, oh, times lambda to the n. Sigma n here means the sum from 1 to n of 1 over k. k is 1 to n. Like that. So you have an F0 and you have an F1 like that, and you can calculate 
you can calculate n lambda from f0 and f1 just using the formulae we've had up to now and you'll discover interesting relations between the Legendre symbol and these, and these series that appear these series that appear here um, just for a bit of fun how about P naught 1 okay so what is P naught 1 so well, what can it be it, 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 it's, it's the set of points X with X identified with LX okay and X is not X is not zero well not in not in not in the uh, not not in, in uh, P naught um, so there's only one point there and if you uh, there's only one point and if you try and impose the condition X equals naught then there are no points and so there is no no, there's no, uh, there, 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 there no point, so to speak. On the other hand, our P of X ought to be X minus Psi X, which is 1 minus Psi times X. And there are no points unless it's singular when Psi equals 1. So if, if um, so the number of points now including X equals 0 so if uh, psi is not 1, then the only solution will be x equals 0. So the number is 1 if uh, psi is 1. And the number is 0 if uh, psi... No, if psi is... Right, if psi is not 1, then the solution is x equals 0. So there's one solution. If psi uh, equals... No, 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 but, but, but our rule was that when we calculate nu, we allow the origin. OK? okay? So, if, so, if psi is not 1, then the only solution is x equals 0. There's one solution. If psi equals 1, there's no equation, and there are p solutions. Right? On the other hand, what is, is, is uh, well, there's no differential operator now, but it's fairly clear what pi 0 is. Pi 0 is going to be sum n factorial over n factorial lambda to the n, which is sum lambda to the n, which is 1 over 1 minus lambda. And this is F0. Um, F0 truncated to p terms is the sum lambda to the n from 1 to p minus 1, which is if, um, and, and lambda is 1 over psi. Um, so if lambda is not 1, then that's lambda to the p minus 1 over lambda minus 1, which indeed is 1. And if uh, lambda is 1, then that's p. So somehow, somehow it works even in minus 1 dimensions. OK. Thank you. OK. Okay, so a quarter of an hour, so we can start. How, how would we um, actually go back to the serious case and uh, prove these expressions? Well, this devolves of a discussion of Dwork's character. Okay, and so there's a function which we call theta, and in the paper, we take theta of x to be given, as we follow Dwork, and we give this in terms of the exponential of pi of x minus x to the p. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, in Wang's lectures, he uses a rather different one, which is e of pi x. Now, it turns out that you can use either one. It makes no difference to the, uh, to, to the expression. Okay. The important point is that there's a, an additive character such that it has a, a couple of important properties. One is that theta of x plus y is theta of x, theta of y. And 
It also has the property that the sum, if you take a sum for y in Fp of theta of y p of x, then this has the delta function property. This is p if p of x <coughs> is zero and it's zero otherwise. Now, there are a couple of interesting things to note. One is that if we take theta of y times the polynomial, this is <coughs> theta of y sigma xi to the fifth minus, minus five psi product of the x's. And using this, uh, the, 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 this uh, fact that theta is an additive character, this becomes theta of minus <coughs> 5 psi product of the x's times the product over i, theta of y xi to the fifth, like that, it breaks up. So that's the first step, is to break up the character that way. Okay. So to break up the character that way, then the further evaluation of this is going to require a knowledge of Gauss sums, so it's going to be good to define Gn to be the sum x in Fp star of theta of x type x n, that's something that's going to arise. Um, this, uh, the Gauss sum is a discrete analogue of the gamma function. So the gamma function appears in, in, in a number of guises in this work. It appears as the, order, as the ordering factorial, it appears um, as the piadic gamma function, and it appears here in the discrete version that's, uh, that's adapted to the discussion of finite. So you have Gn like that, you have a variant which gets evaluated, little Gn of y, which is the sum x in Fp star of the quantity that appears here, theta y x to the fifth times type x to the n. Okay. This one gets evaluated in terms of this one gets evaluated in terms of these other GNs. Okay. Now, um, a little thought. A little thought shows the following, that you can also write theta of x is 1 over p minus 1, sum m equals 0 to p minus 2, g minus m type x to the n, like that. Okay, um, how do you see that that one is true? Well, it's clearly true, right, type x are, are roots of unity. It's clearly true that you, and, and theta of x is a root of unity. It's, it's clearly true that you can make a finite uh, Fourier transform and express theta of x in terms of powers of type x like this, with the powers taken between m equals naught and p minus 2. And the only issue then is what is the coefficient. And then you find the coefficient, so you write this down with an arbitrary coefficient, if you like, and then you evaluate the coefficient by multiplying through by a power of type x and summing, and using the rule, of course, that uh, the sum x in fp star x to the n is 0 if p minus 1 does not divide n, and it's p minus 1 otherwise. Okay? So, 
you have the various bits and pieces on this, on this sheet of paper. Okay. I have this expansion. Clearly, we can take this expansion, substitute into these formulae, and then use this rule to evaluate lots of the sums that come out. So, in this way, oh, and we have to come back to this. Okay, so here's a case when 5 does not divide p minus 1. Okay, then nu is 1 plus p to the fourth plus sum m is 1 to p minus 2 gm to the fifth over g of 5m lambda to the minus n. Okay. Now, the answer is simplest. No, notice, I mean, that there's a very obvious uh, analog to the period, the series for the period, right, that we had sort of before 5m factorial over m factorial to the fifth. Um, I can make it look even better if I change, if I change m to minus m. Um, and use rule and use properties of the uh, of the Gauss sums. But I'd like to go on to discuss another point, which is that I keep on um, taking five not to divide p minus one to write down simple expressions. So what is the story behind that? The story behind that probably is the following that we had this, man we started off with this manifold, sigma xi to the fifth minus five psi product of xi equals naught, and we said there was a group G, <coughs> xi goes to alpha to the ni, xi with alpha to the fifth is one, and sum of the ni is zero mod, mod five. <coughs> And this is an automorphism group of the manifold, but it's actually more than that, because in this case, every calabi manifold has a mirror, and the important property of the mirror is that the Kähler parameters and the complex structure parameters get swapped around. Okay. And the, the, the mirror, in this case, because the, the original manifold is so simple, the mirror is, is simply defined, which is that you take M, the original manifold, you quotient by this automorphism group G, and then there's a complicated story because the, 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 the G has fixed lines and fixed curves, and the fixed curves intersect in fixed points, and you have to blow up, blow up these fixed lines and fixed curves, taking special care with the, the, the places where the curves intersect. And in this way, after you resolved, you get a manifold W. And H11 of W is H21 of M is 101. And H21 of W is H11 of M is 1. OK. And this one, you can understand the number of complex structures being one. Yeah? I'm sorry? Over to the left. That way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you, right, uh, I, I, I was just remarking that number of complex structures you could understand to be one, because that, in fact, is the psi because we said that that was the most general equation invariant under G. Okay. So there's a connection behind this. We have a manifold M, we have another manifold W, which is the quotient of M by G. And this quotient depends for its construction on this fact that alpha to the fifth is one. Now, in the arithmetic context, you can ask when will there exist numbers such that alpha to the fifth is one in FP. And of course, right, so when will there be an inter when will there be uh, numbers such that alpha to the fifth is one in um, 
alpha in Fp, and that happens precisely when 5 divides P minus 1. Okay, so the 5 dividing P minus 1 is, rings a bell as the condition that there should exist non-trivial fifth roots of unity. So we're looking for connections between the manifold and its mirror. These are rather mysterious, but we begin to see them by, um, by the appearance of these conditions. Also, if we look at the... We go back to the formula for calculating the number the numbers of points in terms of the periods, it was sort of miraculous. The formula I wrote down was for the case that 5 does not divide P minus 1. Okay. And it was sort of miraculous that we could calculate the numbers of points in terms of just the first four periods. Right? Remember, there are really 204. Okay. You see the other 200 if 5 divides P minus 1. Okay. So if now we look at if... 5 divides p minus 1, then the formula for nu is the following, that let's work to order p squared, so you get this f naught plus p over 1 minus p f1 timed plus, and so on, and here you get a term do I have it? Plus P. And now you get a sum over these quintic monomials V, a gamma V, that was the 20, 20, 30, and 30, that accounts for the multiplicity, product VIK factorial, product over I. And here, 2F1, AV, VV, CV, psi to minus 5. Also, you take P terms here, P, P, plus, and let me just give you the linear result. So, you find that if 5 divides P minus 1, then the answer involves the other 200 periods, which are calculable. It's not, it's not, it's not so bad. This is the, 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 the first term. Um, and there are, 100 of, there, there are 200 of them, but they, uh, again, there are only 100 differential equations, and it's basically four differential equations with multiplicities 20, 20, 30, and 30. K is, sorry, a bit of personal notation, K is P minus 1 over 5. Okay. So, um, now, also, another point to watch out for in, in mirror symmetry, I'm not sure if Victor is going to uh, talk about this, or, 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 or Dave, but in mirror symmetry, there's a very nice description of mirror symmetry in terms of reflexive polyhedra. So you start off by writing down the Newton polyhedron of the manifold you start with. So in, in our case, we would write down the Newton polyhedron of the terms that occur in the, in the polynomial. And that polyhedron has a dual polyhedron. And these Vs label the points of the polyhedron. So they label the, the points of the um, Newton polyhedron. And they, there, their role is precisely that, that they label the monomials of the equation of the original manifold. In the, if, if that, that role, if you uh, 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 associate it with uh, the manifold, you have two polyhedra. You have the Newton polyhedron and its dual. The dual gives you the fan of the P4. So you, the dual gives you the fan of the embedding space of the variety. For the mirror, the role of the two polyhedra are interchanged. So the poly, the, um, and the points of the polyhedron 
correspond to divisors in the toric variety in which the Calabi-R manifold is embedded. So these Vs, on the one hand, la the, the, these Vs, on the one hand, label the monomials of M, but on the other hand, they also label the divisors of W. So here, when something's happening, which I can't really explain, except to know that, that, that it rings a bell, that when 5, uh, five divides P, uh, P minus 1, then you have the fifth roots of unity that you need to connect you to the mirror manifold. Then you start getting these contributions from these monomials V, which you might think are related somehow to the contributions from the divisors of W. Okay. So, I can't really make this precise, but I find this very interesting that somehow, uh, precisely in these cases, you are seeing extra contributions that you might like to think of, perhaps, as, as contributions from the divisors of the mirror manifold. Okay, so I'll try and make that more precise, and that indeed is sort of the theme that will occupy us when we get on to the zeta function which we'll do next time.